But when one can be sacrificed for the many, why not two, or three, or ten? Little by little, we will find reasons for sacrificing the many for the happiness of the many, and we will think it was a bargain! I say, I hope this is the last of such unpleasant business. I thought it was all rather good. He had some good ideas there at the end. Max, Max, that was a warning, not a suggestion. Max? Sorry, I thought I heard a negative Nancy. It's funny, no matter how many times we take care of her, Negative Nancy is always trying to impede the revolution. You don't want to be a Negative Nancy, do you? This video is sponsored by Keeps, because when they went looking for young men about to go bald, they found History YouTube. You've got hair. You like your hair. You're thinking, why am I getting ads for baldness stuff? I've got hair. Yeah, that's the point, you dingus. Statistically, two out of three men get hit with some kind of hair loss or male pattern baldness by the time they reach 35, and if you don't act fast, then it's gone for good. But it's not too late, because Keeps lets you keeps your hair. Keeps is a hair loss prevention medication used by hundreds of thousands of men that delivers two generic, that means affordable, versions of FDA-approved hair loss products to your door. It typically takes four to six months to see results, so the faster you act, the more hair you keep. Psst. If you are ready to take up arms against hair loss, go to keeps.com slash jackrackham to get 50% off your first order. 1780. The future of France is up in the air. The royal coffers ran dry, paying for feasts at Versailles, while the people of France faced food shortages and price hikes that only seemed to get worse every year. Oh, but don't worry, Louis borrowed a billion livres in debt so that some British colonists halfway around the world could have their freedom. At the same time, a young Maximilien Robespierre has just graduated from law school. He's a brilliant and principled gentleman, an eloquent social activist trying to make a change in the world. He attacked the discrimination faced by so-called illegitimate children, he attacked the sidelining of women in academic life, and above all, he attacked the monarchy. The fact that the king could sign a letter and send you to jail without a trial, and certainly without collecting $200. The fact that the king could charge your son with a crime, and then punish you for it. Hell, Robespierre even gave up his position as a judge out of opposition to the death penalty. Yep, Robespierre opposed the death penalty. Okay. Eventually, he makes a name for himself in local politics and becomes a deputy in the Estates General, France's big special committee that hasn't met in 150 years and is expected to solve all of its tax problems because the king can't figure it out on his own. The problem was, France was a modern society with a feudal government. The estate representing 95% of the population got one-third of the votes, and so... This is dumb. You're dumb. We're making our own council where we all get counted equally and we're the ones making the laws. And bam, just like that, they all got together in an old tennis court at Versailles and decided, guess what? France has a constitution now. Or at least, it's going to. It takes a while to write that stuff. Now, Robespierre is basically just some kid from another province watching history go down, but it doesn't take long before he gets some recognition, because he's not a philosopher in an ivory tower. He's a protester marching on the ground with the women of Paris to hold the king accountable to the people. He's also a part of the Jacobin Club. For the purposes of this video, you can think of them like a political party. And, like, he's new, but Max is killing it. In America, Hamilton defended the Constitution with 51 essays. In France, France, Robespierre's speeches defending the revolution numbered 328, all while working on that constitution and arguing that citizens shouldn't need to own property to vote, and that citizens shouldn't be property. Crazy stuff in 1791. That go-getter attitude gets Robespierre elected as the Secretary of the National Assembly, which is the thing that replaced the Estates General, except now it's called the National Constituent Assembly, but soon it's going to be the Legislative Assembly. Don't worry about the difference, shit's why in France. The thing that's important is that in the middle of all these debates over how to form militias, the right to bear arms, the death penalty, Robespierre brings up a simple little motion that says, once they're done rebranding, no one from the constituent assembly is allowed to be on the legislative assembly. And he gets it passed. This seems wild because Robespierre is on the assembly, and so is everybody else that voted on it, but so were all the moderates. The ones dragging their feet on the revolution. The people who thought, Okay, good job everybody, we're gonna be a constitutional monarchy just like England and it'll be smooth sailing from here. 
Frankly, their views weren't all too popular anymore, it's just that they were the biggest names in politics. But, if they're banned from running, I guess someone more revolutionary will have to fill their shoes, won't they? Downside, the Legislative Assembly ends up being a complete failure with 23 presidents in 11 months. Upside, no more royal apologists in the Assembly, because it turns out the King of France is attempting to use a foreign army to crush the French people into submission. Monarchy is a bad look right now, and even the moderate royalists like Lafayette apparently can't be trusted not to massacre the French people. Downside, Robespierre doesn't want to go to war with Austria, but tough luck, he's not on the assembly anymore. And Brousseau, the new guy in charge, he does want war. The war goes to hell in a handbasket. The French army is not only undertrained, France is teetering on civil war. Most of the commanding officers are noblemen, so either they fled the country, or no one under their command trusts them, much less trusts them with their lives. That's why within 10 days of declaring war, the French went to battle, saw the enemy, immediately ran away, and killed their own general on the way out because he might have been part of a conspiracy, you never know. Everything comes to a head in 1792. Robespierre has just foiled another attempt by Louis to flee the country, and to be honest, everyone's kind of done with the king trying to sell them out to their traditional sworn enemies. Well, one day, the king's head of security is assassinated, and wouldn't you know it, the next morning there's an assault on the palace being led by Robespierre's friends, Danton and Desmoulins. This might be it! Our last stand! Is there nothing we can do to win? Dear, when the enemy is at the gates, even when their voices roar like thunder, even when they number more than the hairs on your head, you must remember, there is always something you can do. Book it! Go, go, go! In an act of humility, Louis runs to the Legislative Assembly for protection, only to find... What are you doing? Get down! What, what are you doing? I thought I was the one under attack. Well... You know how he decided not to prosecute Lafayette for his little whoopsie on the Champs de Mals? Yeah, turns out we're not revolutionary enough for the revolution. The king and his strange bedfellows in the assembly watched on to see what would happen to the Swiss guard defending the palace, and oh boy, it was not pretty. Eventually, the insurrectionists turned their attention to the assembly, and the assembly went, We got him! Louis, you've been a bad, bad boy, and you are officially dethroned! Yeah. Just like that, France is a full-on republic, and the new face of the government is the Paris Commune, a hitherto unmentioned office led by Danton and Desmoulins. Desmoulins is patting himself on the back, thinking, Okay, good job everybody, we're a republic now, and it'll be smooth sailing from here. But that is moderate talk. The question remained, what to do with Louis? Brousseau, who managed to make it out of the insurrection with some sort of a political career intact, argued that if Louis died, there goes all of France's leverage against Austria. And then, an orgy of evidence came pouring out of Louis's closet, revealing that a bunch of moderate revolutionaries were in Louis's pocket trying to keep him in power the entire time. So Robespierre has seriously got to grapple with his whole no death penalty thing. And at the end of the day, he argues thus. To leave Louis alive in prison would be to invite to his troubled nation war and treason, and to exile him would be more dangerous still. With regret, Robespierre declares a fatal truth. Louis must die so that the nation may live. Order! Order! Alright, how many votes for guilty? Yep. All in favor of immediate execution? One, two, three, four, five. All opposed? One, two, three, four, four, four. By a count of 360 to 360, it seems we have a tie. Sorry, sorry, King's cousin here, how you doing? I say we kill him, no questions asked. Well, the king's dead, so I guess we don't have to worry about people conspiring to put him in power. Should be smooth sailing from here. It wasn't. This may come as a shock, but in the process of restructuring France's entire government from the ground up, a lot of people had different ideas about how things should be run, and some people were more revolutionary than others. Now, the moderates were the Girondins, a faction within the Jacobins who basically wanted the same things as everybody else, but were like 20% less extreme about how to get it. But after everything so-called moderates did to betray the revolution before, Robespierre sees only two parties, the people 
and the enemies of the people. Robespierre begins to call for their arrest, and it turns out that when you threaten your political rivals with arrest and execution, they don't respond kindly. The president of the National Assembly, uh, uh, I mean the legislative, no, constitutional, commune, the National Convention, he tells Robespierre, you might have all of Paris wrapped around your finger, but the rest of France is tired. And if you continue to threaten the government, there's more than enough men in France to rise up against Paris. And Robespierre goes, you may be right, but it would be a shame if the people of Paris got to you first. This time, the government is hiding in the palace, and so the palace is stormed once more. The Girondins are captured and taken as hostages, if not killed on the spot. Brissot, once charged with leading France, is charged now with treason and taken to the guillotine. Opposition to Robespierre and his faction is no more. With France under siege by enemies foreign and domestic, Paris must be of one mind. The reign of terror had begun. But Rousseau was right about the rest of the country not being so keen on Robespierre and, uh, you know, terrorism. Frenchmen across the country rise up in revolt, and Robespierre asks himself, Have I become the enemy of the people? No. The people are the enemy of the people! Come October, the Constitution is suspended, and the new supreme government is Robespierre's deliciously ironic Committee of Public Safety. The French army is sent to suppress the counter-revolutions, while in Paris, Robespierre purges the city. The king's cousin is charged with the crimes of his son, guillotined. The philosopher Condorcet was a traitor who criticized the Constitution, even though the government suspended it anyway, guillotined. Danton, who stirred the people of Paris to storm the king's palace and slaughter the royalists in prison, too soft, a counter-revolutionary, guillotined, Desmoulins, Desmoulins. Desmoulins is a child, a spoiled brat whom others have led astray, but he needn't die. He'll burn his journals and show the people our answer to his outrageous criticisms, won't you, Desmoulins? Burning my criticisms is not answering them. What'll it be, Max? You were my friend, Desmoulin, but I must always choose the people. Which people? You'll guillotine every last man in France until there's no one standing but you and a very nervous executioner. Should I be worried? Only if you're guilty. Anyone who's worried is guilty. Robespierre decapitated so many people, he had to upgrade the courtroom so he could sentence 60 people at the same time. Even former presidents of the Republic were getting axed. No one was revolutionary enough for Robespierre. And in the middle of it all, he ended slavery. Wild how one really good thing ended up in the middle there. Seems like the writers did a lazy job of trying to make him redeemable, but it never really went anywhere. And then he started a cult and parading around like a Roman emperor, and I don't even have time to get into all of that nonsense because my first draft of this episode was like half an hour long, but like, look at this shit. Anyway, France finally gets a big win over the Austrians, and for the first time, Paris isn't under threat of an imminent invasion, so the rest of the government asks Robespierre if maybe it's time to dial back the military crackdowns. And Robespierre tells them, What did I tell you about being worried? And yeah, saying you were worried was a literal crime now, because you were seeking to inspire discouragement, and all your neighbors, if they heard you, were legally obligated to turn you in. And you might think, wow, that's insane. How did they process? so many cases, and I'll tell you how. They got rid of witnesses, they got rid of lawyers, they stuck 60 people in a courtroom, and if you were polite, you might be allowed to give your own defense for like 15 minutes, and then they either let you go free, or they decided you were a negative Nancy, and they f***ing murdered you. Robespierre's tribunal system abolished literally every penalty other than the death penalty. So the government is like, oh god, this guy's insane! And Robespierre crashes in through the door shouting, insane, am I? Is that what you've been thinking? You know what this sounds like? London propaganda. There's conspiracists all throughout the government, and I know who you are, and I'm coming to get you. And like, maybe he only had a couple people in mind, but he wouldn't show them a complete list of names, and everyone in that room is thinking the same thing about him, so he's just threatened to execute the entire government. So when Robespierre comes back the next day, everybody attacks him and says, it's traitor! You didn't run your speech through, through the committees before coming here. That's against the rules. You must be conspiring against the government. And Robespierre wants to be like, Have you lost your mind? But ah uh, ah uh, ah, uh, you're not allowed to talk in your defense if you're disrespectful. The only guys who step up to help him are his brother Agustin and a man named Lebas, who come up and say, Oh yeah? If you want to kill Max, 
You'll have to kill us too! All in favor? Aye! Aye. So they're all sent to prison, but they break out, but the army hunts them down and is busting down the doors. Lebat kills himself with a pistol and hands it to Robespierre. Augustin just jumps out the window and impales himself on a bunch of bayonets like a maniac. And Robespierre tried to kill himself, maybe, but they stopped him, so he shot himself in the jaw instead. He's sent to await execution in the same bed as Danton, just for poetic justice. But he didn't have to wait long, because the Committee of Public Safety was very efficient. Max shuts his eyes tight as he's brought to the scaffold and sealed inside his own instrument of death. It's possible he had some last words planned, but to clear his neck, the executioner had to remove the bandage holding his jaw together, and he screamed. An agonizing, blood-curdling scream louder than a tiger. France's most eloquent locutor screamed and screamed and screamed until his lungs went empty forevermore. <laughs>